Let's pray, shall we, as we come to God's word. Almighty God, we thank you for your word to us in the scriptures. We thank you for that word in all its richness and diversity. And so we thank you, Father, now for this passage, perhaps unfamiliar to many of us. We thank you that even here you speak to us. And so we pray by your spirit that you would be at work today as we come to this passage. Would you speak to our hearts? Would you speak to our lives? And would you use these words to equip us to be men and women who serve you, who glorify Christ in every area of our lives, that his name might be lifted high, that he might be rejoiced in and delighted in by more and more people here in Nottingham and across the world, that he might receive the glory due his name. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I wonder how you felt as we heard those verses read just now. Maybe a little uncomfortable. They're not quite like the passages we normally read together in church, are they? Or maybe those words stirred memories for you, fond memories of of past encounters. Perhaps you were taken back to a time when there was one that, that you longed to be with, one you desired to know better. Or maybe you're in that moment right now, And these verses align with a feeling you know very well, the anticipation and and expectation of, of something good yet to come, the desire and, and hope of relationship, of intimacy. Or maybe, as you heard those words, your overwhelming feeling was one of sadness and pain. Memories stirred, yes, but memories of past disappointments, opportunities missed, or perhaps the the very real and, and present pain of betrayal and unfaithfulness. A recognition that that it could have been like this, but it wasn't. Or maybe these verses stirred a well-worn longing that has gone unfulfilled for many years, decades. Oh, that I could have known one like that. Or maybe, just maybe, it, it all felt a bit weird. Maybe you couldn't help but giggle. Is this really in the Bible? Well, friends, as we begin this series in Song of Songs, I'm confident that there will be people here who felt each of those reactions, and some who who are wrestling with a mixture of feelings. And I want to acknowledge as we encounter this book that it will undoubtedly stir emotions for us. Some of them welcome, others not so much. But I also want to affirm that, yes, these words are in the Bible. This book is Scripture, part of God's word to us, his people. And, you know, at one level, that shouldn't surprise us, because this is God's word to his people. It encompasses all of life. It speaks into every sphere of human experience and identity. And more than that, coming into relationship with Christ Jesus, being saved through his death on the cross, being raised with him in his resurrection. Well, that changes every part of who we are. Every fiber of our being is affected. And so, of course, when God speaks into our lives, that includes speaking into the innermost, most personal areas of our experience. 
Of course, our relationship with Christ will affect us in our deepest, most heartfelt, most intimate beings. Or at least it should, shouldn't it? And yet, for so many of us, I think that the kind of passionate, intimate language that we find in these verses is so far removed from our experience of the Christian life. To use this sort of language as we speak of Jesus Christ, well, well, it maybe feels inappropriate or, or irreverent, or perhaps just plain weird. Well, it's my prayer over the coming weeks as we work through this book in our morning services that our understanding of God's love for us in Christ might be expanded that our appreciation of, of the depth of his affection for us might be enhanced, and that our grasp of how human experience of, of desire and longing, of, of sex and sexuality, fits into the bigger picture of all that God has made and intended for us, his creatures, that our grasp of that might be enriched. As we dare ourselves to engage with this unusual part of Scripture. As we set aside for a moment our, our embarrassment and our awkwardness in, in speaking of these deepest human emotions and instead begin to, to consider them in light of God's revelation in the Bible, in light of, of Christ's salvation of his bride, the church, in light of his wonderful plans for our glorious future with him in all eternity, it's my prayer that we might come to treasure this book. And so what is this book? How are we to approach this part of Scripture that is so unlike what we're used to finding in the Bible? Well, it is a song. Solomon's song, we're told in verse 1. Probably not written by Solomon himself, we'll see why later on, but it's Solomon's in the sense that it is consciously part of the wisdom literature we find in the Bible. Written to give us insight into God's plan for humanity, God's blueprint for what life on earth ought to look like. But it is also a song a joyful celebration of love and, and intimacy, sex and marriage. I remember as a teenager, my sister and I cringing every time our dad spoke about sex. Sex is a wonderful gift from God, he would say. But you know what? He was right. And this song celebrates that gift. It's full of, of imagery and, and metaphor, much of it from the natural world around the author, but also architectural and, and military imagery. It's poetic. At times, it feels almost like a, some sort of dream sequence. It doesn't follow a, a neat logical form. There is progression in the book, but it's not linear. We jump straight in, seemingly partway through a thought, and, and the song is certainly still ongoing at the end. It's been, I, I think, helpfully described as being like one of those perfume adverts you see before the film starts at the cinema. You're never quite sure exactly what the story is, but you know it's dramatic, and it's full of emotion and feeling. And by the end, just about at least, you're fairly sure what's being sold. But you know, this book is more than that. It is a celebration of, of the joy and delight that human beings can know through intimate, romantic, and sexual relationship. But it is more. Because you see, this is not just a song. It is the song of songs. Just think about every other time that kind of phrase is used in the Bible. 
the Holy of Holies, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Not just holy, but the Holy of Holies. Not just King, but the King of Kings. Not just Lord, but the Lord of Lords. You see, this is the song. The song above all songs. The song over every other song. And friends, that is why this book cannot only be about the experience of human relationship. Our world, our our culture would have us believe that the greatest fulfillment we can know is in a sexual relationship with another human being. That more and, and better sex is the best we can hope for. That's the greatest song the world has to offer. And you know, so often over the centuries that the church has fallen into the error of of taking that claim and basically agreeing with it. Sure, boundaries are marked out, sex must be kept within marriage, but, but essentially we've gone along with what the world says. Romantic sexual relationship here and now is the highest fulfillment we can know. And yet that is profoundly not the message of Scripture. For here in the Bible, here in the Bible we discover that yes, sex is a wonderful gift from God. But it is a gift that that points beyond itself. That points beyond our, our limited experience in this world. It is a gift that that gives us language and and categories and feelings within which we might begin to understand and express a greater longing, a closer intimacy, a deeper fulfillment. And that's why this is not a book just for, for married people or for those about to get married. It's not some Christian version of the Kama Sutra, no. This is a book that speaks to each and every one of us. Whatever our experience of romantic and sexual relationship, however painful and and disappointing that experience may have been. Because it is not only a description of, of the joy and beauty of an earthly marriage lived in the light of God's wisdom, It is so much more than that. We're used in in the Bible to to the picture of a father and a child to describe our relationship with God. We recognize even, even Christ and his bride, the church. But friends, here we see Yahweh pursuing his beloved. Here we see Jesus Christ as lover, as the lover of our souls. And as we see the depth of his love for us, as we begin to grasp his desire for you and and for me, Well, I think then the tune of our earthly experiences of love and and intimacy, embrace and tenderness, recedes into the background. As we begin to appreciate the music of the true song of songs. As Ian Duggett puts it, the song challenges all of us as failed lovers and points us to the perfect lover who has loved us and given himself for us. It's my prayer in the weeks ahead that that we can begin to hear the Lord Jesus Christ sing these words to us, his cherished and dearly loved people. So let's begin. And let's meet the cast of this wonderful romantic drama. Verse 2. 
Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. Well, we're instantly plunged into the action. Um, already we feel a little as though we're listening into a conversation that perhaps is not meant for us. These are the inner thoughts of a young woman swept up in desire for her man. And let's be clear, this is not a desire for an in-depth Bible study. No, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is more pleasing than wine. This is the language of intimacy, of, of close, loving, physical connection. They're not yet married. That won't come until the beginning of chapter 5. But already she is dreaming of the day when her king will bring her into his chambers. Not that he's really a king. He's a shepherd, as we'll see. But, but can she not dream of her day with her Prince Charming? And yet even as her friends affirm that he is indeed quite the catch, her thoughts quickly turn to what he might think of her. Verse 5. Dark am I, yet lovely, daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. It seems insecurity and concern about body image are nothing new. It's worth noting here that, that there's nothing here about race or, or ethnicity. This is rather a comment on class, on social standing. The woman singing this song has not known the luxury of the aristocratic life, relaxing inside while the servants tend to her needs. No, she has been out, out in the fields, out in the hot Middle Eastern sun. And there's maybe even a, a hint here of a, of a complex, perhaps unhappy background. She speaks of her mother's sons, not her brothers, and of a household filled with anger. She has not known the luxury of a calm and, and peaceful youth. She has not been able to tend to herself, to her own vineyard, as she might have liked. And so as the prospect of, of intimacy with her beloved comes into her thoughts, so too do uncertainty and concern about what he might think of her. And you know, it's just possible as we come to this passage today that some of you here like the sound of close relationship with Jesus Christ. You like the idea of, of his loving, cherishing, intimate embrace. But then a thought comes into your head. Surely he wouldn't want me. Not if he really knew me. Not if he knew my background. Not if he knew the darkness in my life. All of us, I think, in our, our moments of honest self-reflection, find it hard to believe that Jesus Christ might find us lovely, might find us desirable. The ravages of sin in our lives, our own sin and that of those around us, have left a serious and deep stain. What if the one we desire doesn't desire us? And yet, the woman in the song need not have worried. Verse 9. I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. 
it's not a line I'd recommend you use in a Valentine's card. But I think we get the point. He sees in her a certain nobility, a dignity, a deep-seated value and worth. And he goes on. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. She is to him so beautiful, so lovely. And yet what he says next ought to fill us with delight. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. You see, where he finds beauty, he longs to enhance it, to add to it, to make it more beautiful. And so it is with Christ. He knows our every fault. He knows our darkness better than we know it ourselves. And yet still, he loves us. He finds in us a, a, a dignity given to us by him at our creation. But he longs to, to enhance that, to make us more beautiful. The Bible is real about our sin, but it is real too about our Savior's desire to lift us from it. Theologian Martin Luther once said, the grace of God does not find, but creates that which is pleasing to it. We may come to the Lord Jesus Christ just as we are. Indeed, that is all we can do. Dark, yet lovely to him. Carrying all manner of baggage and past. Yet he delights to see us. He longs to see us. And he longs to make us even more beautiful. But let's get back to the song. Because it seems at long last as though our lovers are together. And now they, they linger in each other's presence. Savoring simply being near. She like a perfume, verse 12. He like an aromatic resin, verse 13. Delighting simply to rest in each other's company. And then verse 15, he speaks. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are doves. How handsome you are, my beloved, she replies. Oh, how charming. And our bed is verdant. It's the same word, beautiful, handsome. Their love for one another, the mirror image. Their gaze for each other only. And their hearts quickening in anticipation of the intimacy yet to come. And I want to take a moment here to encourage you, over the coming weeks, to take time to consider your response to the Song of Songs. As we explore this book together, we're going to take it slowly. There'll only be six sermons in this series, but it will take us all term. I hope you will take that opportunity simply to dwell on these words. To consider deeply what God is saying to us through them. If you're not yet a, a Christian, then, then please do engage with this passage of Scripture. Scripture. Hear just what it is that Christianity offers. Feel the depth of relationship, the quality of love that can be yours. Not in some fleeting, fragile, earthly relationship. But in a dependable, 
trustworthy, everlasting relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you already know him, the lover of your soul, then will you take these next few months to drink deeply of the truth that we find here? To enjoy afresh his, his passionate and tender love for you. I've found this book by Julian Hardiman really helpful in my preparation for this series, yes, but also simply in my relationship with Jesus. And this will be on sale throughout the, the series, out in the foyer for just five pounds. Do pick up a copy and take time to, to dwell in this Song of Songs. And it might be, too, that, that as we go through the Song of Songs, you feel inspired to respond in your own more creative way. And I would love to invite you to do that, to write a, a letter or a poem, to paint a picture or, or compose a song, to take time with your beloved Savior, Jesus Christ, and to respond to his love in, in whatever way you would like. At the beginning of December, we'll be making a space here to, to display those responses to the congregation. To share with one another our delight as we have breathed in the pleasing aroma of Christ. As we have looked into his face and allowed him to gaze into ours. And if that lingering, that resting in the loving gaze of Jesus Christ still feels like something you'd be uncomfortable with, then take heart. Because right towards the end of our passage, there's a moment where we see that, that even in the presence of her beloved, our heroine still worries about what he will see in her. I'm a rose of Sharon, she says, a lily of the valleys. And you know, with our limited knowledge of, of Middle Eastern botany, we'd be forgiven for thinking that she's regained her self-confidence. But no. You see, these are common flowers in the region. Pretty, yes, but to a penny. We might imagine her comparing herself, say, to a daisy or a buttercup around here. But to him, to him, she is one of a kind, a lily among thorns. She need not fear his response to her. She is his cherished and precious beloved. And so too are those who belong to Christ Jesus. Each and every one of us loved and valued and cherished and precious to him. No matter how ordinary we may feel. And as we look at him, may we see him as she does her lover. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Though there may be many others who vie for our attention, it is only he who can provide true shade and refreshment. It is only he in whom we will delight for all eternity. There is a warning coming, a note of caution, right in the final verse of our reading today. But more of that next time. 
for now. Let us linger on that image of the beloved gazing with joy upon her lover, faint with love in his tender embrace. I know this week has been full of memories and and tributes to our late Queen Elizabeth II. But there was one card that stood out to me, attached to a bunch of flowers that had been left at Buckingham Palace. I don't know if you can read what it says on screen, but, but this is what's written there. To our Queen, you are finally holding the hand of your dearest husband. And it goes on. It's now your time to rest. And friends, we could spend a a long time digging into the theology of that card. And I'm sure that if Philip is there with her, then Elizabeth will be delighted to see him. But I can tell you this with great certainty. On that final day, Elizabeth, will have eyes for but one man. And it won't be Prince Philip, but rather King Jesus. The king whom she followed and served for so many years. The king who loves her far more than any of those in the queue in London. Far more even than her devoted prince consort. On that day, Elizabeth will join with all those who have known and loved Jesus Christ in delighting to sit in his shade, to be refreshed by his fruit. She will indeed be finally united with her dearest husband. And she will indeed know true and lasting rest. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, that we might join her there and share in that delight. Let's pray. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Lord Jesus, it is our prayer today that by your grace, by your spirit, we might be able to hear you singing those words over us. We thank you that whatever our background however deep the darkness in our lives, that you have pursued us. You have come after us, going all the way to the cross to deal with that darkness and to lift us from it. We thank you that you desire us and that you desire to make us more beautiful in your image. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray this week and and on into the weeks ahead that you would help us to hear your voice in these, your words to us. We recognize there will be a great variety of experience here. Much pain and sadness And yet, Lord Jesus, we pray that we might in you find true delight. Might we know you as the lover of our souls. Amen.